here for Perka Thursday. Um, we have Sarah Collins with us here today from Collins Career Coaching. And I'm going to turn the floor over to her to share um, about what she does and how she helps entrepreneurs. Hi everyone, Sarah Collins, Collins Career Coaching, soon to be renamed because the business has gone through so much evolution that we need to update the brand. And by we, I mean me, it's just me. <laughs> but uh, I say we. Uh, I primarily help teams, organiz organizations, leaders, managers, individual contributors get the best out of themselves. So I am a certified Gallup Clifton Strengths coach and using that assessment I really help people understand what their true talents are and how to use those in their everyday work and personal lives, how to work better with their partners, with their teams, with their leaders uh, in an organization to have more success, achieve more, just be a better version of themselves. That's sort of the, the pitch of what I do today. So, um, tell us how, because uh, Sarah has been a speaker for us before, and she's backed by popular demand. Um, can you share with us, what, for anybody who wasn't here before, how you <coughs> came into this position? Sure, happy to. So, I'm from Hubbard, Nebraska. If anyone's familiar with North, Northeast Nebraska, it's a little tiny town, 234 people. And growing up there, I'm an only child. My mom and dad never went to college. The very blue collar upbringing, they actually met on the floor of a meat packing plant. Uh, so they really encouraged me though that I should go to college someday. But they wanted me to go to the University of Nebraska because they love the corn huskers. You know, there was a lot to love back then. <laughs> I'm just kidding, we still love them. We still love them. Uh, but, so I always grew up sort of thinking I'll go to the University of Nebraska, but no one ever helped me decide what I wanted to do. My parents, you know, they wanted me to go get a higher education, but beyond that, they really couldn't help me. And at my small high school, which, you know, nothing wrong with small high school, but our high school counselor was also the basketball coach and taught driver's ed and taught track. And so he also wasn't a lot of help. He wore too many hats to really sit down with kids to say, hey, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And so going into college, I got into the University of Nebraska, which I think, thank goodness, because I had no backup plan. And I thought, okay, well, you know, what's your major going to be? That's the first question they always ask you. <laughs> and I, the only thing I knew about myself is that I like to talk. <laughs> so I thought, of course, I should be an MTV VJ. <laughs> MTV used to have uh, music videos play after school, and they had Carson Daly there doing the countdown. I thought that should be my job. And I got to college, and I went into broadcasting. I sat down with my advisor, told him my dreams, and he was basically like, no, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> and you know, probably realistically, what he said was, you're going to have to start on the local news. And while now, as a grown-up, that makes sense, at 18, I was like, nope, this ain't for me. I must change my major. <laughs> So because I was 18, making decisions, I thought, what's the easiest thing I can switch my major to where all the classes I've already taken won't be wasted? So I was in the journalism college. They had advertising there. So I thought, that sounds good enough to me. I didn't know what advertising was. At my small school, the closest thing we probably had was the yearbook committee. But I did the yearbook committee. So I thought, advertising, no big deal. Uh, so I go into advertising and I knew I was going to have a problem when I was sitting in class and they said it's very competitive in this field, you need to get an internship, but it's going to be hard. As long as you're passionate, you'll be fine. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm going to have a hard time because I do not feel passionate about advertising. But I persisted, you know, I did a couple of internships. And when I graduated, I thought, I am a big fish in a small pond. I must leave Lincoln, Nebraska. And I moved to Austin, Texas. I did not have a job, but I did have a boyfriend for six months. He said he'd quit his job and come with me. And at the time, 22, I thought, this is it. <laughs> Decision making, not my number one strength. Uh, so I moved to Austin, Texas with a boyfriend and basically no money in our pocket and uh, eventually I found a job doing advertising 
I was sitting at a computer all day building catalogs for this company, working on their website, and I really found that I was quite miserable. Um, not a ton of people interaction where I was working. I was just going to work. They also didn't start till 9 a.m. and I'm a morning person, so I'd show up like at 8.30 and everyone would be like, why are you happy? Why are you even here? I'd be like, ah, it's morning, like let's go. I, I really had a lot of energy for this place that they weren't expecting. And so I'm working in this job and I'm just so drained. It didn't help that my boyfriend didn't have a job for nine months, so like my personal life wasn't going great. We had very little money, very little furniture. You know, we couldn't do all the fun things. And eventually, I just think like this is not the life I'd envisioned for myself. You know, you go to college, you think you're gonna go, go out into the world and really make it. And I get there, and I think this is the opposite of what I thought my life would be. So I eventually start looking for jobs back in Nebraska because I'm like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get away from this boyfriend. I gotta get away from this job. I need to start fresh. I was approached um, online by what I thought was the University of Nebraska-Lincoln saying you should be an admissions counselor. And I thought, yes, OK, I'm going to try that. I send it to my mom because you know, at this point, I'm still only like 23. And my mom says, you do know that this is a job in Curtis, Nebraska. Anybody know Curtis, Nebraska? Yes, so there's a school out there, the Nebraska College of Technical Agriculture. It's a two-year technical school, and that was actually the school. They're affiliated with UNL, but not UNL. And so I thought, whatever, that's fine. I'm from a small town. Curtis is, I think, like 700 people. I can do this. So I uh, moved from Austin, Texas to Curtis, Nebraska to work at this school to do admissions. Um, I end up loving this job. I actually didn't spend that much time in Curtis because as an admissions counselor, I had to travel to high schools across four different states talking to young people about what they wanted to do and talking to high school counselors about what was possible. And I just felt so different. I felt so alive, so energized, so enthusiastic. And I thought, this must be it. This must be the thing I've been looking for. So I tell one of my colleagues, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. And they say, well, you're going to need to get a master's degree because to work in higher ed like this, you need more education. I so, thought, okay, well, there was a program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, which was you know, the only thing I know. So I apply to it, I get in. But for this program, for them to pay for me to go to school, I have to do an assistantship, so work on campus. But they are going to tell me where I have to work. So even though I think I want to do admissions, they say, you, you can't do that. You have to try something new. And they put me in career services. At this time, I'm thinking, do you really want me to be a career coach? Have you seen my resume? I clearly don't know what I'm doing. But the, the director told me, trust me, I think you'll be really good at this. And he was right. I end up loving this job. This is also the first time I experienced the Gallup Clifton Strengths Assessment. It started at the University of Nebraska. We, I taught a freshman level course when I was in grad school where we taught strengths. You know, we gave assessments to students when we were working in career services. They gave it to us as grad students. I was a little embarrassed. Anybody here taken the Clifton Strengths Assessment before? So you have a little bit of familiarity. The idea is there's 34 talents that any person could have. And when you take the assessment, it shows you which of those 34 are strongest for you with the idea that you are born with innate talent. The top five that came up for me in grad school, which are still the same today, positivity, woo, which is winning others over, communication, harmony, and activator. Now, even if you don't know very much about those, you can kind of get the vibe. I sort of also like spew those as I talk to people. I was embarrassed though when I got this because I'm in grad school, so I'm with people that are very smart, people who have more strategic, you know, more analytical, more of that command and responsibility. So I was like, I don't know what I think about this assessment because maybe it's telling me I should just be a preschool teacher because I'm just sort of sunshine and rainbows. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going on with my grad school, and when I was working in career services, they had had a director there who had been there for years. He was beloved on campus, and he retired during my time there. And they had an internal candidate apply. Now, what happened, from my perspective, is half the people who worked there wanted her to get that job, and half the people did not. So she applies, she does not get the job, but the university says, we can't find anyone better, so can you just do it in the interim? <laughs> so basically everyone's mad <laughs> because nobody got what they want really. 
And so the tension was high at, the, at that time. But I'm just a like, grad student. I come in 20 hours a week. I'm just there, sort of oblivious to the drama. And the leader pulled me aside one day to say, I really need to thank you. Right now, things are tough here. The culture is not ideal. You know, people are upset. But when you're here, people seem lighthearted. They start to laugh. They start to come together. You know, it feels a lot lighter. And I'm really appreciative to you for that. So for me, this was my first aha moment of, wow, when I am just myself and I use those natural talents, it really can make a difference. Maybe I shouldn't be trying to hide those and trying to act like other people. Maybe I should just be more like me. So I keep working in career services. I end up going to the College of Business at the university, and they were building the prep program, which is career development curriculum for every business student. So they were making it a requirement that freshmen through senior were taking uh, career development courses, and I got to help build those which was new for me, but also exciting. I also got to teach them. This is the best public speaking training ground you could ever have because I had 68 sophomores at 8.30 in the morning trying to teach them how to build a resume. <laughs> I'll tell you what, people, no one wants to be there less than those 68 <laughs> students. So that's where I really started to learn about taking these concepts that I had done with one-on-one -on -one coaching and bringing them to groups of people. After I left there, I went to Doan, where I was the director of the Career Center. And then when I started, I had a child, I decided to start my own business. I had never wanted to be an entrepreneur. My husband is more entrepreneurial focused. All of his friends have their own businesses. So they had been telling me for years, you could do this. People would want this. I really felt happy and safe in higher ed. I didn't want to do it. But I was working in this time in Crete and living in Lincoln. So that's a 30 minute commute each way. My husband works in tech and so he had a much more flexible schedule and he also made way more money than me. So it just didn't make sense for me as a director of a career center. I was making way less money and working way more hours, spending way more time gone you know, to be the one now having a child. And I always thought, oh, man, I would love to be a stay-at-home mom. So we had, our son was born early, and that was really the catalyst for me to say, I think I'm going to take the leap. And knowing myself and that I love people, I thought I can't stay home probably all the time, but maybe sometime. So we create a schedule where three days a week I was a stay-at-home mom and two days a week I was building this business where I was really doing career coaching for individuals, helping resumes, cover letters, interview skills, job search coaching, uh, really helping people understand. And I always use Gallup Clifton Strengths in that coaching because I think it really helps us figure out where we want to be. Uh, I ended up having twins uh, shortly after having my son. So I had three children, two and under. They're exactly 18 months apart. So it was a blessing personally to have my own business where I could ebb and flow my schedule. Uh, we also had the pandemic happen during this time. My twins were eight months old when the pandemic happened. So that of course throws a wrench in all of the work that we do. And so my business really went through this evolution very naturally. I, I was just, you know, out there helping one-on-one -on -one people with their career needs. But because I was using the assessment, as I got involved in the community and with groups, people would say, can you do a workshop about strengths? Can you, you know, do help my team with this? And so I just started, there's see right here. <laughs> I just started building uh, programs for them. Because I had built courses, it felt really natural to build workshops. And so, as I sort of alluded to in the beginning, Collins Career Coaching, the name is going to change because now, uh, this is about six years since I started the business. I slowly worked my way to full time. I've got a kindergartner now, and my twins will be in pre-K this fall. So I had really wanted to get to when the girls were three. So about last year, I decided to go full time with the business. And it's really been a natural evolution to where now I really focus on helping teams, corporations, organizations in I can really customize things being a one-person show for the most part, you know, where it's a one-time workshop, 
to introduce strengths or maybe it's a year-long development program to help build people internally. Uh, I really help people whatever they feel like they need. You know, I just like to sit down with people and talk about what are your challenges, what are your opportunities, what does your team look like, and build something custom for them. I do have some contractors who work with me who still do career coaching. People still come to us. That's the name of the business still. So people will come to us to say, can you help with a resume? And it's been, uh, it's been great, but of course hard to let that go. But it's been really nice because I have had to learn that I cannot do it all. So there is your 10 minute introduction of me. <laughs> it's interesting that you say that you were never really interested in entrepreneurship, yet the story that you tell is very entrepreneurial. Um, this year, we're really focusing on the entrepreneurial mindset, and mm -hmm. um, that being an entrepreneur does not necessarily have to include starting your own business, that it's about creative problem solving, um, self-motivation, um, being uncomfortable with uncertainty, um, taking risks and having a healthy relationship with failure, which we're finding out that um, many younger people are really struggling with having a healthy relationship with failure. So I'm curious, um, when you were, I mean, you took this leap, you went to Austin with no money, didn't really have a plan. Um, it seems like you are, you do have a healthy relationship with failure, and I didn't know if you could on that. Yes, Brooke, thanks for pointing out how many times I <laughs> failed. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> ah, yeah. Woo. No, I love that. You're right. I, I don't think I would have ever thought that I had a healthy relationship with failure. I think that I have the strength activator. And activator is let's get started now. It's an influencing theme. It comes with a lot of energy. And I think that for me is a guiding force that helps me pivot when something happens. I feel so fortunate and I just like always am grateful. I don't spend too much time worrying about the future. I, you know, of course I have to think about the future and when I think about it, I worry about it. But I try to really stay present, and so if something's not going right, I think, let's pivot. So yeah, when I moved to Texas, I thought this is gonna be great, and then you know, after a while, I think, this is not what I thought it would be, so let's do something. Like, if I decide I wanna do something, I do, and that's where you know, I put my application out there. And, and as a career coach, I talk to people all the time about planned happenstance. It's the idea that we have to plan things. We can't just sit on our couch and be a couch potato, but like we have to go out there, we have to get an education, we have to talk to people, we have to meet people, but there is a happenstance. There's billions of people in the world just all run into each other and making things happen. So if you just start to put some things in motion, stuff will happen that you can't even predict because of the other people in the world. And I really have a faith in that. I will say one of my biggest failures has been I actually tried to quit my business. That was part of the story I didn't tell you. When I was deciding that I wanted to work full time when my girls were getting about three, I thought, I don't want to be an entrepreneur. This is hard. Like, I loved what I do in my business, but the running the business part sucks. <laughs> right? It's like you got to find the sales, and then you got to invoice people, and send them contracts and proposals, and try to resell them. And it's just really hard. This is why I meet with John every month, he, you know? And so I thought, I'm going to go get a real job where they're going to give me a consistent paycheck every month, and I'll just do what I love for an internal organization. And I told the whole world, you can go find it on my website right now. I said, I'm going back to work. I'm quitting my business. And it was an interesting, as a career coach, I know most people get jobs through networking. So I wanted everyone to know about it, even though it felt scary. It felt like. It felt like I was saying my business was a failure. And up until that point, my business had had success over success. I just was like, I hate working alone and having to do all of this by myself. So I told everyone, and people, you know, I had people say, oh, we want you to be our HR director. We want you to work for our company. We want to build you a position. All these different really exciting opportunities. And I followed all of them down. 
And what I found was because I'm a career coach and I do strengths and I know myself so well, I was like, I'm not going to be happy as an HR director. That's not what I'm looking for. Or, I'm not going to be able to do this. I applied for a job locally that I thought I would love and I thought I was a shoe in for, and they didn't hire me. And you want to talk about a real kick to your ego, I really thought I am great and someone would be so lucky to hire me. And then this company that I thought was awesome and I would love to work for was like, thank you, but no thank you. And I, okay, just a real kick in the gut there. And I had another company say, we're going to build you this position. And for months and months and months, I worked with them about what this role would look like. And when it finally got to me and they gave me the job description, I literally just held back tears. I was so upset with what it turned out to be. And I thought, am I really going to do this after all of this? And through the whole process of job searching, I kept saying, well, if I keep my business, here's what I would add, or if I did this. And I had a lot of people sort of telling me either directly or indirectly, you should not quit your business, you should keep doing it. And I just kept saying, stop, no, you don't know, OK? You don't know. And when it came down to it, I really got to sort of my drop dead date of you need to make a decision what you're going to do. I thought, I think I have to just keep doing this business because none of these jobs, could I get one? Sure, there are some I could get, but they're not what I want. And the ones I want, I can't get. <laughs> and so I think the universe and maybe everyone around me is telling me that I'm making a wrong decision here. And so. I kept doing the business. I recommitted to it. It would have been a year and a half ago. And the amount of success that I had last year in it, I would have never dreamed. And I think it is so funny because it seemed to be right there in front of me. And so I was just so convinced that I knew what was best. And really, I think it was something totally different. So yes, I failed at quitting my business. <laughs> And it was a good failure, but I think, it's, I think we should talk about it because I do think that people are afraid to fail. I think there is young people, old people, it feels so scary and I think part of that is because people don't want to talk about it. You get on the internet and you just see people's successes. Oh, here's all the great success. I mean, LinkedIn is sort of a necessity in my job, but man, is it gross because everyone's just like, look how amazing I am. Look at my promotion. Look at my project. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. So it's easy to go on there and be like, well, I feel like crap now. Everyone's awesome and I suck. And I think that we need more people to say, yeah, here's what I did. I tried this. I pitched this company and they said no. I tried to do this thing and it didn't work. If we are honest and authentic about our failures, it makes it less scary to do so. And to take the chances to know that even if it doesn't work out, you'll learn something from it. And I think employers, people out there who are hiring, clients out there who want to hire people with businesses, they want people who have tried something and failed. That experience and what you can learn from that has way more growth in it than someone who just has a clear path of success with no trial or tribulation. Other than um, strengths, obviously, are there other tools or um, resources that you have found to be most helpful for you or for your clients? Yeah. Well, I use strengths primarily just because I feel like it is an assessment that does not put someone in a box. I love assessments, the Enneagram, the colors, so many, you know, what's your Harry Potter character, all of those I love, and I take them, and I think they're great. <coughs> but for me, when I work with people in an organization, what I know to be true, what I believe with my whole heart and soul is that we are so complex. And I think that nobody is one thing. And the Gallup Clifton Strengths Assessment, every one in 33.3 million have the same top five in the same order. Every one in 278,000 have the same top five in different order. So even there, you're really unique. I really look at people's top 10, and I know that each strength you have, so if I have high communication and Jody has high communication, our communication will look different because of our other strengths around it and our life experiences. And so to me, everyone is a puzzle. So I can see your top 10, but I don't know everything about you. I have to talk to you, understand you. And so it allows us to just really be the complex, dynamic individuals we are. And then 
be able to bring that to everyone around us and be able to explain it. But you know, there's a lot of work. I always say that the assessment for us is just a starting point. It is not the end point. We have to take everything we have learned off the page. And it really has to take some mentorship, some coaching, some really like dedication to understanding it. And so I think it is bigger than just the assessment. I also am certified in a program called High Performing Teams. We use Gallup Clifton Strengths in this program as well, but it's actually a, a company out of Slovenia, and they have created a whole program around best practices and what makes a high performing team. And so it is a really dynamic three month transformational change program because if we really want to change, it's going to take more than a one time workshop. And so this is really helping us learn the habits that make people successful. And I think that's one of the things that I'm constantly talking to clients about is our habits. In the book, Atomic Habits by James Clear, he talks about every action we take is the vote for the type of person we want to become. And I think that is something I come back to time and time again with people. It's the little tiny things you do on a daily basis that make you who you are. So if you want to improve, if you want to grow, if you want to develop, you have to just start small. And we talk about in the program just 1% better. If you can just be 1% better today, that will accumulate to something really great. And it's way, way, way easier than if we try to make this big overhaul because we just will go back to our habits. And so I feel like I'm a constant consumer of books and podcasts and connecting with people and I incorporate all of that into what I'm sharing with people. I have the strength input which is a strategic thinking theme. It's the only one I possess and it means to, I love to gather information with the purpose to share it out. So I am just constantly saying to people, have you read this book? You should read this podcast. Oh, I got a great resource for you. It means my desk is terribly messy. <laughs> my input has a physical manifestation that my husband really is irritated about. But it's just always because I think, I got to keep this. I might be able to use it and share it with someone. And I think that that people find really helpful because for me, I do not just talk in theory and ideas. I want to give you something to implement to help you create the habit, make the change. So I'm always telling people if we are together for two hours or five hours or a whole year, even if there's just like one small thing that you take and you can implement that makes your life better, your job easier, your processes smoother, then that has been quite the success. Because over a lifetime, it's those little tiny improvements that help really build us out. Thank you. Um, do you have any recommendations for staying in your balcony? Your strengths rather than your yes, that's great. So she's talking about balcony and basement. So when we think of our Gallup Clifton strengths, there is this idea that your strengths are there's a balcony, the good side, a mature side. So the idea is the the list you get are your talents that you're born with. And if you invest in those, which means using them, working with them, they develop into strength. Now with each strength, there's the great side. So like my activator strength, it has been so helpful in my business because it helps me pivot from the failure. Failure, It's the let's get started now. If I have an idea, I'm like, let's go. Let's execute. Let's get on it. And I can rally people around my ideas. You know, when I'm with a group of people, you can see I could be like, you guys, let's all do this right now. Let's do it. And you would be compelled to do it. It's that energy. So that is the balcony of this, right? It's a mature strength. But there's also the basement, which is the like rougher part of it, which is sometimes I have the problem where I am quick to yes because I get energy from your ideas. So if you are sitting here in this group right now and you're like, Sarah, we should build this program, we should do this thing, I'm gonna be like, yeah, I love that idea, this is great, let's go, let's do that. And then when I get home and I start thinking about it, I'm gonna say, I do not have the time for that. <laughs> Why did I say yes to, you know, I'm gonna start like, mm. and so it's like, what have I gotten myself into? That's the basement of that strength, if it's too quick to yes. And so I always talk to clients about turning the volume up or down on our strengths, you know, and so 
we are in control. If we have these 10 strengths, we can say, okay, I want to use more of this. What happens for me is because Activator is so easy for me to use, it's one of my strongest strengths, and it gets great accolades. People notice it as I crank the volume up on it without thinking. And doing that leads me to the basement of it, right? It leads me to harm myself and put myself in bad situations. So sometimes I have to think, I need to turn the volume down on that. And so again, I think about what are little things that I can do to help me? Shortcuts. And so I've had to practice saying to myself, do not commit to anything in person. Like I, you, okay, when someone has an idea, and sometimes if people are familiar with strengths, I'll say my activator wants to say yes, but I have told myself I'm gonna have to email you tomorrow about that, right? I have to engage a different part of my brain. I have to let myself get a different strength. The other thing I do, which I seriously need to stop telling this story because it's ruining all my tricks. <laughs> As a business owner, I'll sit down with a client and they'll say, we want to do this and this, and I'll be like, okay, this is great. And then when it comes, they'll say, how much does that cost? And God, when we talk about money, I just don't want to because ah, I don't know, I hate pricing. So, because my activator wants to be like, I don't know, it'll be like $200. Ah! <laughs> That's not what it should be, right? And so what I'll say sometimes, zeros. yeah, more zeros. What I'll say sometimes is, let me go talk to my business manager about that and I'll get back to you. Now the truth is, I don't have a business manager, it's just me. But I like to think of it as it's a little white lie because my business manager is Sarah with her responsibility hat on and not her activator hat on, okay? So business manager Sarah needs to think about what the price is in a safer way where she's not just gonna word vomit basically free. And so I like give myself these little tricks because I know where do I get in trouble. And I think that's one of the things that people find most fascinating about strengths is there's this list of 34 strengths. We're going to focus on your top 10. The idea is if you focus on what you do well, you'll get more success, more enjoyment, more fulfillment than if you're always trying to fix what's wrong with yourself, right? So it sort of goes against the popular notion of you can do anything and practice makes perfect. This is saying, well, you can do anything, but if you focus on the things that you don't have talent in, the best you'll ever become is mediocre. If you want to be excellent, you need to focus on the things that are natural for you. And so, when we're looking at our full list and we're focusing on those top 10, we're focusing on those things that come natural to us, you know, this is where our greatness comes from. I appreciate how you point out that we're not cookie cutters, that we're all different, we're like puzzles that have to be put together. And even though the pieces are the same, this puzzle is going to look different than this puzzle. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> you hear all these like strength coaches, whatever, whatever, and you go to somebody for this, and they focus on just these parts. Yeah. Whereas the other parts play roles too, maybe not as major, but minor. So I applaud you for taking it into account for the others. Yes. Well, thank you. I think it is just really the dynamic of the assessment helps us see that. And when you, I've been, it's crazy to me, but when I think about it, I've been doing this for over 12 years. So it's definitely not what I was saying to people. You know, when I was working at UNL, this is not how I was coaching people. It's after years and years of coaching that I'm like, okay, I see now. And it really has been humbling because it's like I thought I knew, you know? And that's why I think having that growth mindset is so important because it's so easy to assume, oh, I've been doing this for 12 years, I know everything, I know the way this is. And I think over and over again, I just sit with people and I go like, oh, that's different than I thought it was. And I think having the open mind to be like, it's okay to change. That's one of the things I've really been trying to hone in on is I can change my mind. I can think one thing and be presented with new information and change my mind. And if someone wants to ask me about that, then I can say, yeah, I have a growth mindset. You know, I, I had, based on the information and experiences I had, this is what I thought it was. And now I've learned, I've been presented with new things and I've, I've evolved over time. And I think that's okay. And I think we all need to have that, especially as entrepreneurs is, being able to pivot and grow and think, you know, 
there could be new information. Sarah? Yes, Mr. Along Radway. That, along that mindset, at the beginning you were saying, I'm rebranding myself. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little more of what's great. Yeah, well, Colin's career coaching really sounds like a career coach, which it is in career coaching, but for most, in my mind, I think of career coaching as really your whole career. Like, I still think of what I do as career coaching, but most people think of it only in a job search phase. So it's not, I think it's misleading for people now because now with the way the business is has shifted, it's really shifted into this team and leadership development mindset. How do we get those high performing teams? How do we get the best of an individual contributor? How do we grow our leaders? And so there's so many concepts that I use from career coaching to still embed and help that. But it really is thinking if I'm going to be able to market myself to more in a, a B to B sense, you know, to more business organizations, more corporations, then I think the name of my company needs to be a little bit more clear. I don't think the new name is going to be more clear, <laughs> but I think what it it give it'll give me more room to grow and pivot because I think. Uh, because I'm evolving. And I was just saying with this growth mindset, the way my business looks today could be really different than how it looks in 10 years. And so the name is actually gonna be a little bit more generic just to be able to allow for that growth and expansion of what we're able to do. Questions, Sarah? Well, I think that's great thinking that uh, I'm reading uh, the, I forget what, the uh, thinking big, and it's talking about positioning yourself for that transition or to grow into a different, rather than here's a business thing that just kills me. We've always done it that way. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, this just kills yourself, your career, your business, everything, and you're changing from that so that you're not thinking, okay, I've always done it this way, whatever. So you're open to so much more possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. I love being able to be receptive to what the clients need. And I think that's one of the great things about being a business of one. I mean, there's lots of challenges, and I clearly try to run away from it. But I think the thing is, I can be agile. And I've tried to use that instead of always honing in on what's wrong with it, really using what's strong, not what's wrong. And what's strong about being a business of one, being really small business, is that you can be more agile and more responsive to the changes and what clients need. And so I love it when somebody comes to me and says, hey, here's what we're thinking. Do you do anything like this? I love to think about Oh, I've never done it before, but let's try it. Let's see what we can create. You know, let's work together to see what do you need, what can I offer, and how can we build something. And it's been really cool if I if I can step away from myself and look at things in a 360 degree view up here of like, yeah, the way it has changed and evolved based on what people need has been a metamorphosis I could have never predicted or imagined which also makes it really hard for me to do strategic planning because I'm like, I don't know. You know, I'm sure it will just happen. <laughs> and that's that they say is wrong. <laughs> Other questions or comments? I've never done strategic planning. I, and, and some of it is because of the nature of my work. And so I can't strategically plan who's going to Right. I can strategically plan my programs, knowing my my client base. Like this will work with this base, this will never work with that base. And so that I'm very strategic about. Yeah. But, um, I, I yeah. I know. I, my mentor is like, you need a five year plan. I'm like, okay, well, in five years. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and because I'm open to what are their needs. And, and that I can custom design. I mean, I've had some programs that have come about because they said we'd like thus and such. I'm like, okay, well, let me think on that and let's see. And 
and and then then that de that deepens the relationship is what you're talking about as well. Absolutely. <laughs> because then you're really meeting their needs. They are they're not hiring you because part of it is maybe what they want, but it's really all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what that makes me think of is I also think one of the things, whether this is right or wrong, but that I've really thought about strategically is how I want my business to grow, right? There's a lot of thought of like bigger, better, more, as big as you can get, you know, and people will say, well, you can hire all these people and build these things. And I, my kids are still so little. I don't want at this stage in my life to be managing a big empire. I'm not looking to make millions of dollars today and have 27 people under me. Again, maybe in the future I will be, but one of the things I've been strategic and thoughtful about is I do want to serve good clients and work with people, but I want to take my kids to school and pick them up. And I don't know if you know this, but school days are short. That is not like the average work day. So that means my work days are shorter than most people's. You know, I'm not working that 40 hours traditional week. Yeah, I might have to do stuff at night and on the weekends to catch up sometimes, but I want to be able to have the physical, mental presence to be with my family. And so part of it is saying it's okay to still have growth and still have new opportunities, but it's also okay to not try to build something bigger at this point. You know, and I remind myself, like, I got a long year of career ahead of me. My kids someday, I hear they'll grow up and they'll move out. I can't imagine that that's real, but it seems to happen to everybody. And they say it happens faster than you think. And so I don't want to waste this time with my babies. You know, I don't want to be. And so I really have honed in on the fact that you can do it all, but you can't do it all at the same time. And so I love this work and I love the clients I have and I want to keep those, but I want to be able to be selective about who I work with so I can be present physically, mentally, emotionally with my family. And, you know, I think if I just keep building slowly, then yeah, when they are bigger, maybe it will look different. Maybe it will be a team of people. And with the new brand I'm getting, I, I do have the strategic vision lightly enough to think this could represent a group of people. Today it'll be me, but someday it could be that. So I think it's just, you know, similar to what you're saying of like being strategic about pieces, but not necessarily having everything. Any other questions? Well, our final question is always favorite local restaurant or oh. local business to shop at? Um, I love Dish. I've had like a renaissance with Dish Restaurant downtown. Gosh, it is just so good. And Rachel, the owner, she was recently on Chopped, if you did not see. So if that doesn't say enough about it, uh, you should definitely check it out because the cuisine is just so amazing. It's worth the downtown parking. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being here, Sarah. Um, Everybody feel free to um, stick around, network. We've got coffee back in the kitchenette. Um, and we will see you all next week. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.